This video is sponsored by Squarespace. More about them later. A Pokemon Nuzlocke has two basic rules. If a Pokemon faints, it's dead forever, and you can only catch one Pokemon per route. There are countless additional rules and clauses that people add to their Nuzlocke's to make them harder, weirder, or simply more enjoyable. And one of the most common that virtually every Nuzlocker uses is the Species Clause. Most interpretations of this clause state that if the Pokemon you encounter on a new route is the same as the Pokemon you've already caught, you can re-roll the encounter until you get an entirely new Pokemon. The idea is to increase the diversity of the Pokemon you'll get to use, while also preventing you from spiritually reincarnating your dead Pokemon over and over and over again. It's an especially important addendum in earlier generations where many routes have similar or even identical encounter tables. But what if you did they didn't use the Species Clause. What would a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Emerald look like without rerolling repeat encounters? Well, that's what we're here to find out. Let's get started. The first thing to do is pick a Hoenn starter, and I go with Mudkip, who in my humble opinion is hands down the best choice for a Nuzlocke. I name my rare female Mudkip Corn, and after obliterating our rival and her Trico, it's off to find a Wormpole. There are three possible routes to get a Wormpole, so my odds are pretty good, though without Species Claws, encounter manipulation is effectively impossible. My first stop is Petalburg Woods, where my encounter ends up being a Poochiana named Pooch. But then, on Route 102, I do indeed find a Wormpole, who I name Wumpy. She'll be important in a moment. After getting Corn to the level cap, I face off against Roxanne, but her rock types are no match for Corn's aquatic firearm. The twin Geodudes go down to a single hit apiece, and even though Nosepass could do some serious damage with repeat rock tombs, she wastes too much time going for hardens and blocks and basically anything but stab damage. A few turns later, we've obtained the first gym badge, and Corn has leveled up to level 16 where she evolves into Marsh Tomp. After saving the world's worst employee for a second time, it's off to Duford Town via Mr. Briny's tiny boat. There I make sure to deliver Mr. Stone's letter to Steven in Granite Cave, and then it's Wumpy's time to shine. She's evolved into Beautifly, who has a quad resistance to fighting type attacks, and is therefore able to easily dispatch all three of the second gym leader Brawly's Pokemon with a few gusts. Dustox with Confusion could do this too, so Wormpole is an excellent early game option for Hoenn Nuzlocks. With two gym badges though, this is where the fun begins. A man outside of Brawly's gym gives me an old rod, and though to the untrained eye it may appear to be just a stick with a piece of string tied to it, the old rod is so much more. It's salvation. Freedom. A chance to fulfill my destiny as the greatest trainer this side of the Mississippi. With the unfettered power of the old rod, I can fish for a magic carp. And without species claws, I can do this many, many, many times. Fun fact, there are 44 different routes and locations in Hoenn where you can fish for magic carp, which means I can get 44 Gyarados. 44 of arguably the strongest non-legendary Pokemon in the entire game. That's right folks, this Nuzlocke is about to get real stupid. Buckle up. Now, it won't actually be 44 Gyarados because I'm not guaranteed to get a Magikarp every single time. In fact, my very first pull in Doofer Town is a Tentacool, which is also a pretty incredible encounter to get multiples of, but for the purpose of this video, any Pokemon that doesn't flop on the deck with a vacant, soulless expression that signals a deep yearning for the sweet release of death is a hard pass, bro. Except you, you stay. At this point in the game, I can fish in 10 locations. When it's all said and done, I've caught 7 Magikarp. Carpy, Carpo, Carpu, Greg, Bup, Floppy, and Oatmeal. With some leveling up, I can evolve the 5 best into Gyarados, who then join Corn on my team. Welcome to the saga of Corn and the Gyarasinko, featuring Floppy, Oatmeal, Carpo, Carpy, and Bup. And even though these Gyarados all look the same, they each have their own personality and role on the team. Floppy's the fun one. With a bit of hard work, she could be a real force of nature, but she just loves palling around with her Gara bros and getting up to hood Rattata sh**. <laughs> Oatmeal's a classic shy guy who yearns for love. I think he has a crush on Floppy, but he's far too modest to be the showboat type that Floppy usually falls for. Carpo is a sporty girl. She loves the outdoors and rarely spends any time in her Pokeball. As a child, she was really self-conscious about being a tomboy, but she's really embraced it in her adolescence and everyone likes her much more for just being herself. 
Carpy is probably the nicest guy you'll ever meet. He's the kind of friend that will text you out of the blue just to tell you he's thinking about you and that he's lucky to be your friend. But no, Carpy, I'm lucky to be your friend. I'm lucky to be your friend. And last but not least is Bup. He's a pretty loud dude. He likes to be the center of attention and has a lot of confidence. It can come off annoying to most, though Floppy actually finds it quite endearing. Don't tell Oatmeal, but I think Floppy and Bup are a bit of an item. And even though Bup can rub people the wrong way, he means well and doesn't have an unkind bone in his body. The only thing bigger than his personality is his heart. The Garasinko is a tight-knit squad, so even after fishing for a few more Magikarp around Mauville City, the team remains unchanged as we face off against Watson for the third gym badge. Rather famously, Gyarados has a quad weakness to Electric-type attacks, making Corn with her secondary ground typing the perfect yin to the Garasinko's yang. A few mud shots and Watson's electric type menaces are easily defeated, winning us the third gym badge. And it's a pretty quick trip through Northern Hoenn to get to the fight against the fourth gym leader, Flannery. There's only two places to fish here, and both are duds. Given that we have a full team of water types, Flannery is expectedly a breeze, like the one in my hair on the weekend. Corn takes care of her first three Pokemon with super effective water guns and mud shots, and then the Garasinko collectively deal with Torkoal. Floppy is the one who gets the kill with a Dragon Rage, ultimately winning us the battle. But next is our first potentially difficult gym fight. Norman uses normal types, which don't have any particularly exploitable weakness. My strategy is to just relentlessly throw Gyarados at his Pokemon until they go down. And it starts out pretty well, actually. Carpo manages to take out the first three of his Pokemon all by herself simply by spamming strength. Of course, Norman's final Pokemon is also his scariest, but by switching around between the members of the Garasinko, we can lower Slacking's attack with Intimidate and attack on his low turns. I also make sure to go for a few leers so that we can hopefully get the kill before Norman tries to heal with a bunch of hyper potions. All of this does risk critical hits, but it's unavoidable. After two leers, I bring in the boisterous bup. He knows Rock Smash, which he uses for a little chunk of damage, and to lower Slacking's defense by one more stage. And then, on the next turn, he fires off one last strength. But Slay King survives with a sliver and retaliates with a counter, instantly killing Bup. The first death of a run is always tragic, and even though Sweet Floppy is able to come in and take out Slacking a few turns later, I can't help but feel like this battle was a failure. Bup will be forever in our hearts, and he'll never be replaced. Metaphorically, of course, in actuality we've got three other Magikarps in the box, and that number is about to explode, because Wally's dad just gave us the HM for Surf, unlocking almost a dozen new spots to fish for Magikarp. On Route 120, you're forced to encounter Kecleon before you can get to a fishing spot, so there's no chance at a Magikarp there. And after a full minute of trying to fish in the Aqua Hideout, I learned that there are no encounters here in Generation 3. But even then, when it's all said and done, we've pulled a pretty impressive haul. Which means it's time for a roll call! Karpu, Remy, Mushi, Jimbo, Pikachu, Gina, Stuerta, Rachel, Umlau, Opie, and Greg. I decide to bring Mushi the Adamant onto the team as the fifth member of the new Garasinko. She's a hard worker, and despite some initial fears of being the new girl, she quickly fits in with her teammates. I think she might even have a bit of a crush on Oatmeal, especially after the battle against Winona's flying types. Unlike virtually every other Gyarados ever, Oatmeal is a special attacker. Oatmeal does use strength to two-shot Swablu, but after that, it's nothing but special attacks. And sure, he can't one-shot a single one of Winona's Pokémon, even her Tropius with a quad-effective Ice Beam, but it's fine. What Oatmeal lacks in raw special attacking talent, he makes up for in grit and determination. Plus, he's humble enough to know when he needs help. Mushi comes in to deal with Tropius and Pelipper, but then Oatmeal tags back in to two-shot Winona's Skarmory with Thunderbolt. Then against Altaria, he can fire off Ice Beams. Even with a Dragon Dance boost, Stereo Ace barely scratches Oatmeal, so just like that, Oatmeal and Mushi have defeated Winona, and we've won badge number six. Oh, uh, Flygon HG? Garchomp FJ, what are you doing here? Well, 
I don't mean to derail your narrative, but you're almost halfway through the video and you haven't done the sponsorship segment yet. Did you forget? No, I didn't forget. I, I just was waiting for the perfect timing to Ice Cube, go! Ah! This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Squarespace is an online platform that helps you build and manage your own website, whether that's an online store for your business or a personal blog for your thoughts. Using their all-in-one platform and customizable templates, it's quick and painless to easily create professional and polished websites. And with their new Fluid Engine design system featuring drag-and-drop technology, it's easier than ever before to fine-tune every single detail of your website. For example, I use Squarespace to launch PoppyHG.com, the only destination to find curated pictures of my corgi puppy, Poppy. I think I have a new favorite picture of her, by the way. Just a look at how happy she is. Squarespace also has a ton of other really useful features like analytic information about the traffic of your website and Squarespace member areas, which can be used to connect with audiences and create exclusive members only content. So if you're looking to start a website for your business or hobby, then you should absolutely check out squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch your website, you can use my custom link to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Now, let's get back to the challenge. With the new level cap of 43, Corn can finally evolve into Swampert, and after clearing through some straightforward Team Magma and Aqua fights, the Eastern Seas of Hoenn are ours to explore, which means that it's time for our largest fishing extravaganza yet. I think this warrants a fishing montage. Route 124! Route 125! Moss Deep City! Route 126! Route 127! Route 128! Evergrande City! Route 129! Route 130! Route 131! Pacific Lodge Town! Route 132! Route 133! Shoal Cave! Honestly, the haul is pretty underwhelming. Six Magikarp from 14 locations is an embarrassment, but the tentacles were real thirsty. Nothing I could do about it. Still, to our roster, we've added the Meg, Rita, RVD, can we trust him? Magellan, Dumbledore, and Pooch. Of course, not to be confused with Pooch. None of these bright-eyed rookies are worth bringing onto the team, so it's off to face down Tate and Liza with Porn and the Garasinko squad. I've got a pretty ingenious strategy for dealing with Tate and Liza, who are often thought of as one of the hardest fights in the game. It starts by leading with Corn and Oatmeal into their Clay Doll and Zatu, and then, get this, I'm gonna click Surf with both Pokemon. And the plan is to do this over and over again, though it's not actually doing quite as much damage as I would have hoped. The double up doesn't even kill Claydol, and the only reason it does meaningful damage to Zatu is because Corn crits through her Calm Mind boost. On the next turn, I decide to go for Strength into Claydol as Tate and Liza both use a Hyper Potion, but that doesn't do much damage either. So, even though Corn gets off another strong Surf, it's not enough to kill Claydol. On the next turn, Zatu hits Oatmeal with a Confuse Ray, which fortunately Oatmeal just breaks out of to land a Strength. Though that doesn't get the kill on Claydol either, so they can launch another Earthquake into Corn before she finally gets the first knockout of the battle with a third Surf. Lunatone comes in next, so it's back to double Surf spam, but not before Zatu lands a critical hit Psychic into Oatmeal, leaving him with a sliver of HP. Oatmeal luckily snaps out of confusion, so he doesn't take himself out, and he lands another Surf for some small damage onto Lunatone and Zatu. Sadly, it's not enough for a fourth surf from Corn to kill Zatu or Lunatone, but at the very least, Lunatone just goes for Calm Mind, ensuring that Oatmeal lives. I switch him out into Mushi as Zatu hits her with another Psychic. Then Corn goes for surf number five, which once again leaves both of her enemies with a sliver of HP. So Lunatone hits Mushi with a Psychic that, like Oatmeal before her, leaves her with a Sliver. This is quickly getting out of control. The next turn starts with another switch, this time to Carpy. 
Tate and Liza use another Hyper Potion on Lunatone, and then Zatu gets another critical hit Psychic, bringing my Gyarados into the red for the third time in as many turns. At the very least, Korn can take out Zatu with a Surf, but with Solrock coming in, things are looking tight. I've got two more fully healthy Gyarados waiting in the back, but I really need to kill Lunatone here, so expecting Carpy to go down, I just have him fire off a Dragon Rage, desperately hoping that it's just enough for Korn to get the KO with Surf. A tidal wave flows over Lunatone, and the Cosmic Rock falls. Since Solrock survives, though, I fear that this is the end of Carpy. But Solrock just charges up a Solar Beam, like an idiot. Because even though they get back some HP with a Citrus Berry, a combination of Dragon Rage from Carpy, and an 8th Surf from Corn takes out Tate and Liza's final Pokemon, miraculously winning us the 7th Gym Badge completely deathless. That was very close to being an absolute disaster. And speaking of absolute disasters, I found the Submersible! R remember the Submersible saga that had a chokehold on the internet for a week and a half? Anyways, in the Seafloor Cavern, I catch another Magikarp named Floam before smacking Archie and his Stabla Sharpedo into next week. But then it's off to Sutopolis, where the mighty titans Groudon and Kyogre are waging a violent war that threatens the fate of the entire world. Don't mind me, guys. Just fishing for my 24th Magikarp. Just, just pretend I'm not even here. After awakening Rayquaza and saving the day, it's time for the fight against Juan for the 8th Gym Badge. Most of his Pokémon are barely a problem. Mushi can take care of Juan's Love Disk, Wish Cash, and Celio all by herself. She does ultimately get paralyzed by a Body Slam from Celio, so as Kingdra comes out, I switch out to Floppy. This lets Juan get off a double team for free, and here's where things get annoying. Kingdra knows Ice Beam, Water Pulse, Double Team, and Rest. Since I don't have a way to quickly take him out, my best bet is to stall. Fortunately, Carpy's been prepped for exactly that. With his naturally solid special defense stat and access to rest and protect, he can pretty easily stall Kingdra out of all of his Ice Beam PP and eventually also his Water Pulse PP, making sure to switch out when and if we get confused, of course. And then after that, we just need to keep trying to attack Kingdra through double teams. Eventually, Carpy's able to connect with a few strengths and take him out. That just leaves Crawdont, but after a few more strengths, the battle against Juan is won. There's one last fishing encounter on the deepest floor of Victory Road where I catch my 25th and final Magikarp subscribe. <clears throat> but with that, we've made it to the Pokemon League where our final challenges await. Most of our final team is the same. Korn, the infallible leader and electric type counter. Floppy, who's holding a silk scarf to help her fire off powerful normal type moves like Strength, Hyper Beam, and Return. Carpy, the bulkiest of the batch, is ready to stall out even the toughest of opponents with Protect, Rest, and Toxic. Mushi, with her adamant nature, is one of our strongest and fastest attackers. And then there's Oatmeal, the special attacking Bolt Beamer. But last is a substitution. Carpo is out, and Billiam, the Magikarp from Sutopolis, is in. Perhaps it was a result of his harsh environment, but Billiam is an absolute beast. Impressive IVs and an adamant nature make him a force to be reckoned with, and more than worthy of the Master Ball I used to catch him. With these six powerhouses, it's time to become champions of the Pokemon League. First up for the Elite Four is Sydney, and like usual, any moderately powerful move is enough to sweep through his incredibly flimsy team. Normally, I just skim through this fight, but I gotta show you the first few turns because the RNG is absurd. Korn first kills his lead Mightyana with a critical hit Surf. Then his Cacturn comes out and I switch to Billiam who dodges a Cotton Spore, which is a move that I would have confidently said had 100% accuracy. But apparently it's only 85% accurate until Generation 5. Anyways, after that, Billiam also lands a critical hit with Return for the one shot. Two critical hits and a dodge is pretty wild. It's easy to harp on bad luck in Nuzlocks, but it does tend to even itself out. Not that we really needed any RNG help against Sydney anyways, but you get my point. A few turns later, Billiam has swept the rest of Sydney's team with return, and victory is ours. Which means that Phoebe is next. Her lead Dusclops almost always goes for Protect on turn 1, so I use the opportunity to set up a Rain Dance with Korn. 
With a 50% boost to our water type moves, Surfs proceed to one-shot every single one of her ghost types, save for her final Dusclops. Not only does the rain stop once Dusclops comes out, she's also bulky enough to not even take 50% from an unboosted Surf, so in order to avoid a whole heal palooza thing, I first set up a second rain dance, and then take her out on the following turn, netting us an easy victory. That's the end of our free lunch though. Glacia's third, and she's gonna make us work for a W. I lead with Corn to try and take out as many of her Pokemon as we can with Earthquake before falling into range of a critical hit. She gets KOs on both Celios and the first of Glacia's Glalies, but by the time the second one comes out, we gotta switch to Billiam. He can get a two-shot with Return, but not before losing about two-thirds of his HP. As Walrein comes in last, it's off to Carpy. I'm hoping that we can stall her out with Rest, similarly to how we dealt with Wan's Kingdra, but Carpy gets immediately frozen on the switch, so that's the end of that. After a few turns of trying to thaw out, I switch to Oatmeal, and as I do, Walrein immediately crits for well over 50%. I decide to stay in and hit her with a Thunderbolt for seemingly exactly half of her HP. We manage to dodge a second crit, but it doesn't really matter since Walrein recovers some HP with a Citrus Berry. So now it's off to Floppy. Oatmeal was at low enough HP to bait Body Slam, which does basically nothing to Floppy, but obviously gets the Paralysis. I decide to go for a Hyper Beam on the next turn, which after tanking another Ice Beam connects through Paralysis, but leaves Walrein with a Sliver. So as Floppy recharges, Walrein gets to heal for free. Another Ice Beam brings Floppy into the yellow as she manages to connect with another return that also happens to crit. Like I said, all the RNG balances out. With that, I switch to Mushi, the last of my healthy Garadai. An Ice Beam thankfully doesn't freeze, so with one final Hyper Beam, we take out Walrein and win the battle against Glacia. That was certainly more than a little sweaty. Here's the aftermath of that whole fiasco. A little too close for comfort, personally. But that means that we've made it to the final member of the Elite Four, Drake. So it's Oatmeal's chance to shine. Since Drake's lead Shelgon almost always goes for Protect on turn one, I first set up a Dragon Dance. Oatmeal is exclusively a special attacker, so this is just for the speed boost so that we can outspeed Salamence and Flygon. On the following turn, an Ice Beam hits Shelgon hard, but he survives in the red and connects with a Rock Tomb. Drake heals, so a second Ice Beam brings him back into the red. A freeze there would have been pretty cool, no pun intended. I try for a second Dragon Dance, hoping that Shelgon will go for a Protect or miss with Rock Tomb, but neither happens, so I just take the kill on the following turn. I guess Oatmeal doesn't really have what it takes to be a special attacker. As Salamence comes out, I switch to Corn on a resisted Rock Slide. Salamence outspeeds to hit a pretty strong Dragon Claw, but then we clap back with an Ice Beam for the one shot. Altaria is third and surprises me with a speedy double edge. Nice. But then we can get the KO with another Ice Beam. That brings in Kingdra, so it's off to Billiam as he goes for a Limp Surf. A return does just shy of 50% as Kingdra seems content with just going for some squishy surfs. So in order to guarantee the KO, I have Billiam fire off a Hyper Beam. This is a tad scary since we'll need to recharge as Drake brings in his final Pokemon Flygon, but a special crunch is doing baby damage into Billiam anyways. Dragon Breath puts Billiam in range to a crit, so after hitting Flygon with a return, I switch out to Mushi. She tanks a few Dragon Breaths no problem, and then closes out the battle with one last massive Hyper Beam. All of a sudden, we're up against the champion of the Hoenn League, Wallace. Honestly, this is not the best matchup, and the questionably funny gimmick of using a bunch of Gyarados may come to bite me in the butt here. One way or another though, this is the end of attempt one. So let's do it. Wallace leads with Wailord, and I lead with Billiam. A return does a massive chunk of damage, but so too does a blizzard from our enemy's chunky fish. I decide to go for another risky Hyper Beam here. It finishes off Wailord, but then exposes Billiam to an attack from Tentacruel who comes in second. Fortunately, he just goes for Toxic, which gets healed by a held Pecha Berry. Tentacruel then misses his second Toxic like a chump, and Billiam retaliates with an Earthquake for the one shot. So far, so great. My Lodic is third, so I go for another return, which does about the same amount of damage as it did to Wailord. My Lodic, however, retaliates with a nasty critical hit Ice Beam, putting Billiam at just 42 HP. 
I know it's suicide, but I really don't want to deal with this Milotic healing, so I have Billiam take the kill with another Hyper Beam. Sadly, this brings in Ludicolo, who's free to kill Sweet Billiam with a Giga Drain as we're forced to recharge. Okay, so I guess Giga Drain just doesn't kill here? Fine by me, time to deal with this annoying ass Ludicolo. With Double Team Leech Seed and Giga Drain, it's quite possible for this thing to sweep entire teams with just a little bit of bad luck. If you're gonna prepare for anything in an Emerald Nuzlocke, you need to prepare for this Ludicolo. Aerial Ace helps out a ton, though of course my five flying types can't learn it. Dub Trio though? Yeah, Aerial Ace that sucker up. Since Giga Drain only has 5 PP, I can fairly safely stall Ludicolo out with Rest from Carpy and some switches. Even Leech Seed only has 10 PP, so after getting Ludicolo to the point where his only attacking move is Surf, Mushi is safe to take him out with a few strengths. That leaves Wallace with just two Pokemon left, the first being Whiskash. Since Mushi is in the yellow by the time we get the KO on Ludicolo, I switch out to Corn on a Hyper Beam. With Whiskash forced to recharge on the following turn, we can easily take him out with two Earthquakes before he gets off any more damage. Just like that, Wallace is down to his final Pokemon, Gyarados. How perfectly poetic. I switch to Oatmeal as Wallace goes for an Earthquake. And then, Oatmeal fires off a massive, quad-effective, magnet-boosted Thunderbolt that fails to get the KO. Which means, anticlimatically, I have to wait for Wallace to use his third and fourth full restore until Oatmeal is able to take out his mirror match with one final Thunderbolt, winning us not just the battle, but the entire run. Well, surprise, surprise, somehow against all odds, I was able to beat a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Emerald with 25 Gyarados and a Swampert. I'm not sure if this stupid gimmick was strong enough of a concept to carry an entire video, but hopefully it was still a good time. And at the very least, I think it goes to show you why the Species Clause, in my opinion, is pretty important. If you enjoyed watching, it'd be great if you could like the video and subscribe to the channel. Or don't, I don't know. But I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future ROM hack challenges. You should also subscribe to my highlights channel to get highlights of the challenge I'm currently streaming before it's cut down to a video on the main channel. And you should consider subscribing to my Patreon or becoming a channel member on YouTube, which are the best ways to directly support the channel. The links to everything are in the description below. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play with Species Claws. See what I did there?